scientists working on that satellite look like uh, surgeons building scaffold in an operation theater. It's such a clean environment. And it is a success, not all the world. Dr. Sita is a member of the International Astronomical Union, the life member of the Astronomical Society of India, and the Astronautical Society of India also. She has over 85 publications in her, uh, uh, sorry, uh, publications in refereed journals and several other in conference proceedings. Yeah. She has guided five students for PhD and has taught courses on astronomical techniques and high energy astrophysics at the Indian Institute of Science Primary. Of course, she has got many awards, only a few of them are in green. The C.V. Ramanian Scientist Award in Physical Science for the year 2003. She also obtained the Best Woman Scientist Award for the year 2004 from the Astronomical Society, Astronomical Society of India. She's a member of the, uh, as a member of uh, she won Team Excellence Award of ISRO for AstroSat Mission 2015, well deservedly. And uh, many others are there. And anyway, a person of uh, such eminence has graced this occasion by agreeing to speak to uh, speak on a subject which is very interesting stories of the universe from AstroSat. I really feel bad that AstroSat has not got as much. As it deserves, I think. So I'm sure that Dr. Sita will do a good job for that today. And thank you very much. And once again, I thank uh, uh, the Astronomical Society of India and uh, EOEC of that. The representatives are there. Thank you very much for all of you for attending. Now I hand over the mic to Shalini. Only Canada. Only one. 
Yes. <laughs> 
very often you would have seen uh, image of sources in H alpha. H alpha is because hydrogen is one of the dominant um, gases in all these stars, and H alpha is a very prominent indicator of many aspects of stars. So H alpha images are very popular. Yeah. Okay. 
dangerous from one thirty to three hundred nanometers with some breaks in between in two channels. NUV uh, from two hundred to three hundred nanometers and far UV one thirty to or uh, one eighty nanometers. So the UV optics is very good. It can take images over one. Uh, half a degree, that is 28 arc minutes, with a resolution of 1.5 arc seconds or better. In fact, we have gone down to 1.2 arc seconds in some images. So, uh, the advantage is you can take snapshots of galaxies, full galaxy within few hundred milliseconds, and you.
the big advantage we had with the UV imaging telescope is we could in fact isolate some of these stars as individual objects because of our resolution of 1.5 seconds. By taking minimal number of images with minimal minimum exposure time, we could isolate them. It's not that HST cannot isolate, etc. It has much better spatial resolution. But it also has a much smaller field of view. So if you want to see the whole cluster, you will have to take many, many more exposures and that's why the UVIT scores. Okay? So, with UVIT we find different populations of stars in these clusters. And then, let me give you an interaction, a little bit of deviation. If you take a group of stars and you plot them, on what is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, forget the name, it's called HR diagram. with only one blue spectrum. 
white dwarf which might be extremely low mass and therefore the conjecture is that the original star was it was a twin star one of the stars evolved fast it became a white dwarf in that in that uh, in that cluster and it donated much of its mass to the companion and because it donated it that star has now become blue it is very hot and it is now known as a blue star okay so that is the context and so we find that the binary theory works for many of the blue stars yeah and then we have planetary nebulae now i talked about white dwarfs white dwarfs are visible as single objects they are visible as binaries they are visible as binaries with other companion stars which can which in turn can also donate mass so that was blue star as well already the white dwarf has donated mass to the companion there are also x ray objects where the other way works so some of the individual white dwarfs are often found in what is called the planetary nebula so this the center portion has a white dwarf this has thrown out this is like a star like a sun in billions of years it will throw off its outer layers and the core will become a likely white dwarf so also this star what what we call planetary nebula has thrown off its outer layers and the center star is a white dwarf but now i draw your uh, attention to the faint glow this dark glow this you could see only in far ultraviolet using the unit image and uh, this is seen in ngc 40 a black in a black also in ngc 6330 6330 which is called the butterfly nebula and this is what is this due to this might be due to ionized gas around it and uh, what is causing this ionization maybe due to the central star we still don't know what is this halo due to but lots of studies are going on especially on this butterfly planetary nebula where lots of structures are seen in different filters and so on so take a hubble space as telescope and now observe this extensively in various filters now coming to us from white dwarfs go to neutron stars and black holes how do we observe neutron black holes and neutron stars many of you may have heard that 
Why is 
set close to zero becomes 10,000 times and this particular burst, we have observed many such bursting sources, this particular bursting sources, source is a very rare uh, bursting source because it emits bursts within the span of few minutes. This whole thing is finishing in around uh, 12 minutes or so. so. 7 minutes to first to second and 5 minutes to second to third. And so this is a puzzling thing because if the whole thing gets a nuclear burst, how is matter getting accreted again on within a span of 7 minutes? Is the question. Or can it do partial burst? That is, do nuclear burning only for some portion and not do it for some other portion and then it ignites the other portion and you get another burst. So these are all things which we are looking into. These explosions, just to give you an indication of the energy, this is uh, in a burst you can get within a few seconds 10 to the power 39 Hertz, which is of the order of 10 to the power 20 times that of the Nagasaki bomb. Um, so this is what we have found here studying many such bursts. Then, uh, so that is a source which doesn't, which has a very low magnetic field. So matter gets accreted onto the surface, it goes all over the surface. Now, if you see a source, neutron source, which has a high magnetic field, then you will see profiles like this, which correspond to the spin, pro, spin period of the neutron star. And if you vary the energy, if you find it as a function of energy, you will find that it varies, the profile varies with energy. And so the X rays which come out from the source may be actually coming out from different portions along the magnetic field lines. So, uh, that is something which can be modeled by finding out the different energy profiles of this. And then we also see cyclotron profiles, cyclotron absorption features and these can in fact be correlated directly to the magnetic field of the neutron star and neutron stars we now have about 10 sources in which we have detected the cyclotron features and these indicate magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the power 12 Gauss. 10 to the power 12 Gauss, Andre. Now the earth magnetic field is a mark. Other things intensely by half a Gauss. Gauss is a unit, unit and equal magnetic. The magnitude, magnitude is not the bar magnitude. Other the strength is the bar, the other the stronger, the other the less stronger. So Gauss is the strength of the magnetic. We measure it in Gauss, we measure it in Tesla, etc. So earth to the magnetic field vary half a Gauss. But it is so effective in protecting us from the charged particles which come from the sun, which come from the cosmic rays, etc. They, they divert them away from coming into the surface and that's how we are all very comfortably living. Whereas this, you see, is million into million times the amount of intensity in magnetic field. And they are, and remember these neutron stars are very small, they are just few kilometers in radius and they spin so fast and we see these profiles because of the spinning and the matter getting accreted along the magnetic force and the X-rays are emitted along the course. So uh, what is important about this is with X-rays you can actually sample many of these objects with high gravity, neutron stars you know have gravity of the order of 10 to the power 14 to 10 to the power 15 centimeter per second square compared to 980 which is the gravity in the earth. 1000 versus 10 to the power 14. Magnetic field again a factor of million million. Temperatures of course the neutron stars per se don't have very high temperatures but the matter getting accreted is of the order of many degrees. So many of these things, many of these features can be only studied in astronomical objects. You 
You cannot create this kind of gravity in sources at all or in labs. And we use these objects as labs for understanding the phenomena. So, and then now I come to galaxies. Uh, uh, galaxies, this is a, this you might have seen many times, I suppose. This is one of the first galaxies which we made with you in. And uh, this is just a comparison of a similar NASA satellite which was flown earlier. It had a, it had a resolution of 4 arcs, I think, 4, four to 5 arcs. And you can see the effect of resolution. You can see these as individual objects and we have isolated them and we lots of star forming regions. UV, you can, uh, uh, is very good at identifying where star forming is actually taking place. So you have 72 such regions identified on this galaxy where star formation is taking place. And then we come to galaxies like Active, which host active galactic nuclei. Active galactic nuclei are supermassive black holes of the order of 10 to the power 8 or 10 to the power 9 mass. And they are usually at the centers of galaxies. And they are many times much brighter than the whole galaxy. And here you see a galaxy with an active galactic nuclei and there is a lane of dust here which you can see very clearly in, in near UV but you can't see it so clearly in the far UV image and you can see the emission from the galaxy. In fact, they have been with this, they have been identi being able to identify the emission separately from the galaxy and from the nucleus and they have been able to model these two emissions separately. And further, they are also correlated with the X-ray emission from this and form how, what could be the emission regions for this. And then we come to some sources called either they are interacting galaxies that is either they have been formed due to merging of galaxies or they have interacted and the galaxies could have moved away or they could be galaxies in a cluster of them. This is a cluster of galaxies called an abelian design and it's called a jellyfish. You can see the shape, it looks like a jellyfish. And so these are called jellyfish galaxies. This is one type of jellyfish galaxy called JO201. This is caused getting due to this galaxy moving into denser regions of this cluster. And when it moves into that, the ramp pressure actually strips away the gas from the galaxy and it moves on. And that's how you find all these tentacles or what, you call, what we call tails. And you find this gas moves away and you can find star forming in these regions, which is very bright in NUV. This is actually a composite of both the optical and NUV and this is purely NUV and you can see the star forming regions here. Yeah, so, and then now I come to the, can I take some moments? Uh, this is one of our discovery results. I don't know if many of you would have heard about it. Let me also explain, because it gives me great joy to explain this result. This is Lyman continuum emission from a galaxy at, at a distance of Z of 1.42. Z is a measure of the distance and uh, the distance is measured from us as Z is equal to zero and far away distances. If you say the if you say the universe age is um, around 20 million years, then Z this is of the order of 10, 13, etc. The edge of the edge of the universe. Yeah, so this is just. Z equal to 1.42. You might say, oh, what is so special? It's very nearby. You can, in fact, see galaxies at Z equal to 3, and uh, JWST is measuring galaxies at Z equal to 6, Z equal to 8, etc. The thing is, Lyman continuum is a very important, uh, it is below 1000 angstroms, around 900 angstroms. And why this Lyman continuum is important is because in the early universe, when matter started forming, 
the mass of the sun if you squeeze it to few kilometers few kilometers and i say say from where where you live vijayanagar okay so uh, vijayanagar is of your order of about 12 kilometers right so you reduce it by divide by 4 so from here to say majestic possible okay so the black hole has a mass like the sun but it doesn't have a huge diameter it has a small diameter as much as from here to majestic therefore mass over radius becomes very 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 high. yeah so that is how it gets more dark anyone else
James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. Hubble Space Telescope primarily has observed it. Optical, little bit of infrared, and human. Okay. 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 It does not observe in X-rays. JWST also observes in primarily in infrared, but in other methods. But does it observe in X-rays? There are telescopes which observe in UV and X-rays, but the X-ray band in those and the UV band is not similar to ours. We, uh, there is a telescope on XMM Newton which actually for XMM Newton observes in X-rays but they also have a UV optical monitor. But the UV doesn't have far UV, it has only UV. So we combine far UV, near UV and the broad energy range of X-rays. Optical, actually, in the near UV channel, there is an optical channel, but we primarily use it for actually correcting the um, drift of the sun. So we use the channel for um, for correcting the UV images. I mean, using sunshine, sir, or like that? Pardon? I mean, using sunshine, sir, for correcting that, or like that? Oh, the satellite also has. But to achieve this 1.5 arc second resolution, we need to further that. So in fact, one of the speciality of AstroSat is that one, many of these detectors, which I told you, all the papers, many of them actually collect the data as individual photons, and the data is also received on ground as individual photons. So that is how we can correct it by actually on ground. So we will just be observing, but we 
build programs. It's also because of that our brain that they'll be observing at that time and the sun will be in the field of you and so on. So it becomes difficult. And that was one reason, that was the niche thing we found that in order to um, we have within India experts in optical UV, optical primarily, and they have many of the observers, many of the astronomers have the UV astronomy using the IUE telescope. So they were very, very